welcome to this session titled Reformation and Reformations. This is hosted by the Martin Luther and Global Lutheran Traditions Unit and the Reformed Theology and History Unit. May I ask for the steering committee members to stand up so we can thank you. Great. This panel is gathered here with representatives from the globally diverse Lutheran and Reformed traditions. These are four very brave souls. It's hard to be the one voicing the concerns and joys and hopes of all in your tradition. So these are very brave individuals who have agreed to do this. The invitation for the panelists is to tackle the question of relevance with the Reformation for our day. We are interested of the future of the Protestant traditions, and we want to name areas and issues that call for retrieval, reframing, and retraction. For our traditions to continue as life-giving and theologically orienting forces in our lives and in our children's lives. We will follow the order in the book. Each panelist will have about 20 to 30 minutes, and they have a chance to react to one another's comments, and we hope a feisty reactions, feisty reactions. And then we will open the floor for all of us to have a conversation. There will be lists uh, where you are welcome to write your name and email to a list. We are not asking for your money, but that will get you in the mailing list or emailing list. So uh, uh, Cynthia has the one for the Reformed Tradition Group. And who will do that for the Lutherans? Maybe Elsa Marie, would you do that? I have a piece of paper to circulate here for names um, uh, of people who are here. So our first speaker is Dr. Amy Plantinga Pau from a Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. She is the editor of the Believe Theological Commentary Series, and her new book out this fall is called Church in Ordinary Time. A Wisdom Ecclesiology by Erdmanns. And I'm asking Dr. Pau, as I'm asking all the panelists, to say one sentence or two sentences about a project they'd like to highlight. It could be a publication or project you're working on now. And then one sentence, what excites you about Reformation? And then you go with your paper. But first, we welcome Dr. Pau. Thank you very much. The project I'm working on now is uh, a reformed aesthetics, and one of the questions motivating my project is why have Protestants often been so bad at aesthetics? Um, and what excites me about the Reformation, uh, the concept of Reformation, is that I think after 500 years there is still so much unfinished business for Protestant churches. I belong to a reformed branch of Protestantism, and my tribe has come in for some trenchant criticism over the last several years. We are the progenitors of the unintended reformation. We are accused of paving the way for secularism and individualism in the modern West by promulgating a form of Christianity unmoored from tradition and spiritual disciplines. And ironically, these criticisms of Protestantism have received reinforcement from some of those leading the celebrations of this big Reformation anniversary. How many times this year have we been told that the essential mark of Reformation Protestantism is a direct encounter with God's grace unmediated by any human-made institution. In my remarks this afternoon, I want to respond to both these critics and these cheerleaders by delving into an example of John Calvin's practical ecclesiology. I'm aware of the criticism that reformed approaches to church structures are just an example of the problem and the reformed allergy to concentrations of power and its functional pragmatism about church office, some critics see a distillation of all that is wrong with Protestant traditions. Here, critics say, is a vision of the church 
as an institution for humans to tinker with as they please, a humanly devised means to organize or edify Christian life. By failing to receive the church's or ordering and structure as something divinely established, something given to us by Christ, they leave the door open to just those tendencies to individualism and interiority that have bedeviled Protestantism from the beginning. Reformed Christians, they say, may profess to be devoted to corporate practices of prayer, sacraments, and reading scripture, yet their cavalier attitude towards the order that sustains and transmits these practices undermines these commitments. Their lack of adherence to the church's time-honored structures denies the concrete historical givenness of the church. In short, the reformed lack of ecclesial density has led to osteoporosis in the body of Christ. So in the face of this criticism, I stand with many contemporary Catholics who, like me, suffer from a messier vision of the church's history. What we might call the symbolic geography of the church is not a closed book. Christian faith has been understood and lived in many different ways over its 2,000 year history, and its essential order and structures have taken strikingly different forms. What is demanded of us, I think, is not an ahistoric dogmatism, that what exists is divinely established and thus cannot be changed, but the cultiv cultivation of a practical wisdom, guided by prayer and scripture, about what faithfulness looks like in a particular time and place. Church structures do not exist in some timeless perfection. They are always a matter of making new and making do. This means taking into account the constraints of our temporal creaturehood and the changing needs of the community. And I would add that this is true in the Roman Catholic Church as well as in Protestant churches. How else to understand not just the quiet creep of married clergy from other traditions into the Catholic priesthood, but also the stunning transition of lay people into leadership roles in Catholic institutions, including the parish, where they carry out tasks previously carried out by the ordained and the vowed. The theological and the concrete must be held together in church life, and this requires asking questions about power and participation and purpose in the church. It requires subjecting institutional structures to honest evaluation and scrutiny. I argue that John Calvin's practice of reforming ecclesial structures remains instructive for us today. In making the case that, quote, celibacy should not be required in a minister, quote, quote, Calvin, I think, gets the genre right. He writes a pastoral letter. His arguments are a public attempt to work out the propriety of change in the organizational life of the church by engaging in the back and forth of communal argument and discernment. Now, to be sure, Calvin is separated from us by a long series of cultural dislocations about the institution of marriage, about the role of women in society and the church, about homoeroticism, but he models for us what I like to call a wisdom ecclesiology, an approach to church that takes into account the constraints and blessings of our embodied creaturehood. It has room for acknowledging both the concrete realities of individuals and the needs of future generations. 
As theologian Mark Jordan notes, sex has always been a nervous preoccupation for Christian speaking. And Calvin, in the 16th century, is taking on the oldest means in Western Christianity for constructing and regulating sexual identities. He has his work cut out for him. So maybe it's not surprising that Calvin begins his pastoral letter on a conciliatory note. Because the practice is so long standing, the rule of clerical celibacy has the presumption of reasonableness. Marriage, Calvin acknowledges, can be a distraction. And continence in sexual matters lends, he says, not a little dignity to the holy ministry. Calvin is certainly not interested in innovation for innovation's sake. But the fact of a church law or tradition is not sufficient in and of itself to decide against further reform. Even the most ancient traditions can be challenged and changed when it becomes apparent that they no longer serve the ends for which they were instituted. Calvin is pleased to hear that church authorities he is writing to are not using what he calls pressure or tyranny to force celibacy on those who hold ecclesiastical office. In Calvin's eyes, that would be an abuse of their teaching authority. Calvin, moreover, moreover, applauds their good intentions. They are trying to convince ministerial candidates of what they judge to be in the best interests of the church. Yet he respectfully disagrees with their judgment. Celibacy has its own disadvantages, Calvin says, and these are not inconsiderable and not all of one type. Even, he says, if it were agreed that nothing is more liberating than celibacy and nothing more impeding than marriage, it sh still should not keep us from thinking, taking thought for need. It is certain, he says, that many who were otherwise suited for the ministry cannot usefully do without marriage. The church is called to be a community of truth-telling, and this truth cannot be in the form of abstract declarations about what is ideal in the sexual lives of ministers. It has to reckon with the concrete realities of embodied people. Calvin states his point frankly. God has provided the gifts that properly ordain the ministry, he says, and we see that celibacy is not among them. Now Calvin models here a kind of ecclesial self-questioning that ties together the witness of scripture and changing pastoral realities. What was once helpful can become outmoded. What was once faithful can become corrupted. Such is the case, Calvin thinks, with the church's ordination practices. There was no law requiring celibacy in the early church, Calvin notes, but an absurd admiration for it became so strong that marriage was condemned as shameful for bishops. Afterward, he says, the severity of a law gradually kept crept in and has produced countless forms of evil for us. What good, he says, it has brought, I cannot judge. He continues, I always fear that it is dangerous for celibacy to be honored extravagantly, for good men may, may be frightened away from marriage, even when their need of it is urgent. So even though the church authorities to whom Calvin is writing are not commanding celibacy as a definite law, Calvin is worried that they are, quote, in effect establishing a law when they consider married men of less value. Now Calvin is here calling into question more than the celibacy requirements of clergy. He is challenging a powerful Western consensus in place since the fourth century about Christian hierarchies of virtue and reward. 
In these hierarchies, perpetual virginity occupies the highest position, then abstinence, then celibacy, abstinence in marriage, and then sexual activity in marriage beneath that. In arguing for the equality of all the baptized, that those who marry and have sex are no worse in the eyes of God than virgins or celibates, Calvin is reviving the views of Jovinian, a late fourth century Roman Christian whose excommunication over this issue marks a hardening of church teaching about the superiority of celibacy over marriage. Michel Foucault has taught us that a distinctive feature of Christianity is an obligation to bear witness against oneself. He has also shown us how this obligation to bear witness against oneself can curdle into potent forms of social control. Calvin, however, insists that bearing witness against ourselves in the plural, in our efforts to live as church, can be liberating. He is facing down powerful institutional devices that resist truth-telling around sexual desire. Life under grace, he says, requires honesty about the church's self-protective silences. While Calvin agrees that some church leaders have been given the gift of celibacy, he thinks that requiring it of all has been a pastoral disaster, fomenting both self-righteousness on one hand and despair and hypocrisy on the other. Bearing witness to this failure, he thinks, is necessary if the church is to be reformed. Now Calvin says that permitting marriage for clergy reflects what he calls the needs of nature. And like many 16th century Europeans, Calvin could be quick to label things he disapproved of as being against nature. But I take heart from Calvin's calm response to the agitated language of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 about what is natural and what is degrading when it comes to public markers of gender identity. What Paul calls natural, Calvin says, is what was at that time in common use by universal consent and custom. So Calvin here appeals to historical understanding to show that Paul's judgment about short hair for men should not be binding on the Christians of the 16th century. Calvin notes it was not always reckoned a disgrace for men to have long hair. Even in Paul's time, Calvin says, men in Gaul and Germany still wore their hair long. But in the Greco-Roman context in which Paul was writing, it was reckoned an unbecoming thing for a man to allow his hair to grow long. Thus, Calvin concludes, Paul reckons as nature a custom that had come to be confirmed. Reckons as nature a custom that had come to be confirmed. In other words, Paul's understanding of what is natural and what is degrading is socially constructed, a reflection of the customs of his time. Likewise, our understandings of the needs of nature in the pastoral office are not themselves natural or timeless. They too have their genealogies, their social functions. Calvin concludes his argument by looking ahead. Even if the church authorities in particular circumstances find that encouraging celibacy is not an obstacle for them at present, he says that is not enough reason to continue the practice. Austerity in this matter, he says, can be a great obstacle to future generations for whom, as you know, we must take note. In its practical theology, the church should take care lest its unduly austere practices exercise pressure and tyranny on future generations of Christians who may be living under very different circumstances. 
by taking into account both the present needs of individuals and the long-term needs of the community, Calvin opens the door to an ecclesial future he could not have imagined. Women clergy, queer clergy, queer married clergy. The point of Reformation Protestantism is not to escape church, but to be honest about what a mess we can make of it. From that point of view, the Reformation still has plenty of unfinished business. There are still powerful institutional devices that resist truth-telling within the church. Life under grace requires honesty about these self-protective silences. Protestants, I think, have still not come to terms with the consequences of their exaltation of heterosexual marriage. Like celibacy in Calvin's time, marriage is now at the top of the Protestant hierarchy of Christian virtues. Its ex exaltation has some of the same dangers Calvin worried about with mandatory celibacy, excluding people with gifts for ministry, functioning as a screen to hide sexual secrets and give the appearance that all is well. Protestants still have not come to terms with the legacy of slavery and colonialism, with the history of violence against religious others. Christianity is a material way of life a way of conducting public bodily life in community. It is about teaching bodies, and thus one of its first tasks is to be honest about our embodied creaturehood, the ways in which church has been both at its best and at its worst when it comes to bodies. What will the church look like if we risk this kind of honesty? That was Calvin's question, and I think it remains ours today. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. If you have right now something you would like to ask Dr. Pau, you have a chance to do that later too, but we have a couple of minutes. The topic is pretty sexy. I'm sure you have questions. Yes. Yes. It's a microphone. I'm wondering if you could comment on Calvin's uh, work with the consistory. It seems to me it, it supports your argument that Calvin was pretty flexible when it came right down to it. Flexible is not the word, but pretty uh, feet on the ground when it came to decisions about paternity and that kind of thing uh, when people came with problems before the consistory. Role of the consistory for Calvin, um, the the big two, 2009 anniversary of Calvin produced a biography of Calvin whose title was "Sober, Strict, and Scriptural," and and that may not give you much hope, right, that he'd be flexible. Um, but I I think what you find when he is in actual church situations is that he he recognizes how messy human life can be, uh, and that there is uh, a kind of, of room uh, for growth and for repentance uh, and for, for change uh, in, in the life of the church. Um, I would not lift up all his uh, consistory judgments as an example of flexibility and, and mercy, um, but I think uh, some of his um, his accounts of real human problems, real human dilemmas, uh, do show that kind of flexibility. Yes, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you for a very clear and uh, provocative paper. There's two issues that uh, seem to me to be central, which I don't think you mentioned. One is the uh, 
the agreement, I think, consensus among historians today that the institution of the celibacy rule, when the celibacy rule became official, it did so for many reasons, but one of the number one reasons had to do with ritual purity. That is, it's when the, when the Eucharist displaced baptism as the central sacrament of the Catholic Church, it's precisely then that the celibacy rule became official. And Luther comes close to dealing with that, but he deals even more directly with the second issue, and that is a power analysis. For Luther, celibacy is wrong because celibacy is an issue of power. And uh, if you look at the, for instance, his treatment of ordination in De Captivitate Babylonica, you can see that for Luther, it's all an issue of power. It's really not about sex at all. Uh, so in other words, does Calvin have a power analysis integrated into his critique or not? And what about the issue of ritual purity? Thank you very much. Uh, I think Calvin is, of course, at, at a remove from these, these issues compared to, to Luther. Uh, and so I, I see um, less um, of, a, of a kind of um, intimate knowledge of, of how celibacy uh, functions in, in church. Uh, Calvin is trying to figure out what new church structures are going to look like, uh, whereas I see Luther devoting a lot of his energy to showing what's wrong with the ones, ones he's got. Um, so I, I do think there is a shift there. And, and I think the, the point about the, the ritual purity of, of Eucharist is well taken. Uh, I don't uh, see Calvin making, making that argument. Um, that that um, he is not concerned with purity uh, in the, the sacraments on, on that level as, as much um, as the health of the, the, the local church and, and how he f thinks that's being endangered by, by uh, keeping to the celibacy rule. So I, I, I do think that Calvin is in some ways in a different situation, a different context than Luther on this, on this matter. Thank you. We'll take questions more after our, we've heard all the panelists. So why we have this big room? I know why. Something happened. 500 years ago, October 31, what happened? 95 tweets by Luther, then Calvin, people in the middle, and what Luther, Calvin, Marie Dantier, Argola von Krumpa, what all these 16th century people did as a result of that theological avalanche that started with the reformers, we are still talking about it. So 500 years to remember that, that is why we got this biggest party room. And it happens next time in 500 years. So let's enjoy this space. <laughs> Speaking of, our next speaker is Dr. Kristen E. Kwam from St. Paul School of Theology. And I just learned that she's been coming to AAR 30 years. That's three years longer than I've been coming. And she's now the new co-chair of our group with Alan Jurgensen for the next uh, five years. Uh, her most recent work is published in the now complete six volumes, The Annotated Luther, The Annotated Luther by Fortress Press, and her work deals with Luther's words of comfort for women who experience miscarriage. And I'm going to ask Dr. Kwam also to give us uh, an update your current research or interest and what excites you about the word Reformation. Thank you, Dr. Sterna. Thank you, Dr. Powell. That was really tremendous. Um, in terms of con uh, current work, um, I'm pleased that 2017 is almost behind us, and that will allow me to return to a long overdue manuscript for the a belief series that Amy Planting and Powell is editing. Um, I'm working on the Psalms with uh, Don Saliers. And um, it was really nice in the annotated Luther to be able to work with Luther's preface to the Psalter, um, which kind of kept me grounded in that psalm work. So th thank you. Uh, what has excited me about the Reformation for a long time 
was my uh, discovery as a graduate student that Luther uh, endorsed uh, the equality of women and men in unprecedented ways uh, in his Genesis lectures. You're, you'll hear a little bit of that research toward the end of my remarks today, but um, that led to writing a book called Eve and Adam, an anthology of Jewish, Christian, and Muslim interpretations of Genesis 1 through 3, and also the, a similar text in the Quran, um, and where uh, I was reinforced in my sense that Luther's emphasis on Eve's equality was, is, was unprecedented. What a year 2017 has been. My participation here marks my final responsibility for commemorating the 500 years. So I am grateful for the invitation to be on this panel addressing the theme Reformation and Reformations. I have entitled my presentation, Christian Repentance and Reformation Calling. My remarks move in two steps. An initial consideration of the character of Luther's text, popularly called the 95 Theses, and then second, a turn to some particular points for Christian consideration as ways to hear their calling to repentance today. So, Reformation calling and Christian repentance. Christian practices and pastoral concerns have important relations to the theological teachings that launched and undergirded the Protestant proposals for reforming church and society in the 16th century. The recent text from Conflict to Communion pointed out that even contemporary Roman Catholics have come to understand that interconnections between practice and theology, rather than a desire to divide the great church, formed the basis of the Reformation of the 16th century. Now, in the wake of all the commemorations of 1517 of the past year in the USA and of the past decade in Germany, we who are Christian also should recognize ways that assessing the relationships between teaching and practice should be part of the Reformation's ongoing call to us as ecclesial communities and to us as particular persons. As many of you know, Luther's so-called 95 Theses has the official title, The Disputation on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences. This text offers a remarkable example of Luther's concern to evaluate theological teachings that are taught by practices. The first of the 95 Theses asserts, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. With this statement, Luther criticized teachings that only tied repentance to a liturgical process, the sacrament of penance. According to his understanding, ongoing and daily repentance should be a hallmark of the life of the baptized. In other words, the Christian calling includes the vocation of repentance. Whatever way the theses were made public, posted on a door or not, I think this summer we heard uh, uh, Tim Wengert um, say that they were never nailed, nails were expensive, um, they may have been glued. Um, whatever way they were posted and made public, they generated rounds of debate and discussion as they were translated and circulated throughout Europe. A touchstone for the ongoing reception of Luther's theses ought to involve examining and discussing particular practices and teachings of the church in light of the gospel of God's grace. Luther's new understanding of repentance was undergirded by recovering the accents of turning and change embedded in the Greek sense of the term. According to Luther, being forgiven by God changes the lives of believers, opening up possibilities for true repentance. The dynamism of metanoia underscores that repentance involves transformation. As we move away from the fervor of 2017 commemorations, what ways might Christian believers, be they Protestant or not, 
continue to remember and be shaped by Protestant reformations. As a Christian theologian who is a lay member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA, I have been thinking and speaking often about this question. I have some particular concerns that grow out of my study and decade-long experience as a member of the Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity, the international dialogue between Roman Catholics and Lutherans. My context as a seminary professor who teaches in the area of constructive theology also informs my perspective. So in the spirit of Martin Luther, I offer a few ideas and themes for discussion and debate during the second half of today's session. With a nod to the original 95 theses, I have constructed nine of them. After listing them, I will say a word, more really several words about each one. The th nine theses are, thesis one, repentance is an expansive calling. Thesis two, repentance includes the teachings and practices of congregations and other ecclesial expressions. Thesis three, repentance involves attending to the needs of neighbors near and far. Thesis four, repentance involves discussion and argument. Thesis five, Repentance recognizes theological diversity in practices and teachings. Thesis six, repentance calls Protestants to reform practices and teachings about Roman Catholicism. Thesis seven, repentance involves reforming, even transforming practices and teachings about women. Thesis eight, repentance entails the reform of practices and teachings relating to neighbors who are not Christian. Thesis nine, repentance arises from the encouragement of God's grace. So thesis one, repentance is an expansive calling. The accent of Luther's first thesis on the entire lives of believers underscores the importance of examining the whole of our lives, not just our pieties and our religious acts, at every aspect of our living. All facets of our lives hold opportunities for those of us who are believers to ask, how do I re incorporate repentance into this time and space? Thesis two, repentance includes the teachings and practices of congregations and other ecclesial expressions. The phrase, the entire lives of believers, ought not refer only to our lives as individual persons. Instead, it includes our social and communal lives. For those of us in the ELCA, the lives of believers involves the life of congregations and of our denomination. It also includes our life in the church Catholic, as well as in the worldwide communion we know through Lutheran World Federation. I imagine those of you who are Christian have similar expressions to in your church involvement, local and middle range, national and global. When we talk about repentance from these vantage points, which teachings and practices ought we reconsider? For example, what might it mean as a congregation to discuss, we have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone? reflecting on that congregation's corporate participation in sins of commission and omission. What might it mean for denominations to discuss the ways they collude with perpetuating such sins as racism, sexism, classism, heterosexism, etc.? Thesis three, repentance involves attending the needs of our neighbors near and far. Attending to the needs of our neighbors ought to mark Christian repentance. Luther's new understanding of repentance accented, the, the, accented our turning and change. According to Luther, being forgiven by God changes the lives of believers. Saints who are simultaneously sinful and justified are freed by the gospel to witness to God's grace. No longer bound by fear and despair, they are turned personally and communally to serve their neighbors. 
So many forces today make us wary and even suspicious of other persons. Yet Christians are called to take notice of what is happening to neighbors near and far and to respond to their needs for food, water, and shelter, as well as for dignity and respect. Contemporary communications allow us to know our neighbors' specific needs in unprecedented ways. How ought Christians respond? Often a distinction is made between responses characterized as charity, which, direct and, which are direct and immediate actions, and other responses that are more slow and mediated because they work at changing public policies. With this distinction in mind, I again ask, how ought Christians respond? Thesis four, repentance involves discussion and argument. Thesis four centers on debate. Some people have the impression that churches are not places for debate. Congregations often shy away from engaging in controversy. Denominations too, oh, excuse me, denominations do too, and sometimes for very similar reasons. Debates might further divisions in the body of Christ. Loss of members also entails loss of resources and influence. Yet the Lutheran movement in particular and the Protestant Reformation as a whole had their onsets in the midst of calls for attentive discussion and thoughtful debate, examining which practices promote the doctrine of God's grace to sinners and which ones undercut this central teaching. Congregations and other ecclesial bodies ought to form Christian piety and witness so that it is equipped to participate in thought-provoking and thoughtful debate. Thesis five. Repentance recognizes theological diversity in practices and teachings. Thesis five recognizes the importance of theological difference. Students in my introduction to systematic theology course often start the semester believing that Christian unity means there is only one Christian position on a matter. And ironically, it's often the position they themselves hold. Protestant reformations often were riddled with similar assumptions. A gift to us all from the ecumenical movement of the 20th century has been the recognition that theological diversity is not only legitimate, it also is faithful. Notions such as reconciled diversity offer us ways to talk about the blessings that flow from recognizing and even celebrating that teachings can be different without being church dividing. <coughs> Thesis six, repentance calls Protestants to reform practices and teachings about Roman Catholicism. Thesis six moves from theological diversity in general to speaking particularly about Roman Catholics. Talking about vocation and repentance necessitates a thesis speaking to the hostile divisions between Roman Catholics and Protestants. Deep suspicions and aggressive, even violent actions all too often have marked the ways that Protestants and Roman Catholics have regarded one another and acted toward each other. I am convinced that we need to repent of the ways that our relations have been marked by opposition and by hostility. I also recognize that reconciling our diversity is a more difficult practice in relations with the Roman Church than within Protestantism. A question here is how ought Protestants regard the Roman Catholic Church, as well as how might worldwide communions, as well as denominations and congregations, repent for the ways they perpetuate church division and rancor within the body of Christ. Thesis seven, repentance involves reforming, even transforming practices and teachings about women. Many Christians today recognize the need for church teachings to reform theological anthropologies that present women's subordination to men in home, church, and society as the will of God. Protestants bear a particular responsibility here. Historians of early modernity have drawn attention to ways that the Protestant model for family life reinscribed and reinforced the patriarchal orderings for households and towns, churches and nation states and whole societies. 
We need Christian theologians and regular saints who will proclaim and enact anthropologies that stress that equality and mutuality between women and men is God's original and abiding will for human life. A question here is how ought we to continue to change Christian practices and teachings about women and about men? Thesis eight, repentance entails the reform of interfaith relations, practices, and teachings relating to neighbors who are not Christian. The anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism of Martin Luther has received much attention during 2017 and rightfully so. The need for ongoing repentance and transformation is clear. What will be the signs of such repentance? In addition to written and spoken apologies, as well as supporting and participating in interfaith dialogues, it also will be important to reform and even transform Christian teachings about our neighbors who are Jewish and Muslim, Native American and indigenous African, Hindu and Buddhist. A question here is, how ought we reform or even transform Christian practices and teaching about neighbors who are not Christian? Thesis nine, repentance arises from God's grace and its encouragement. As many of you know, I spend a lot of time immersed in the stories of Genesis, especially the primal tales about Eve and Adam. You also may know that Luther spent much time there too, lecturing on the book of Genesis for nearly the last decade of his life. I have brought a bit of my research into this final thesis. To do so, I need to move to narrative mode and take you back to Eden back to the time in that narrative when God returns to the garden after Eve and Adam have tasted the forbidden fruit. Luther in his Genesis lectures noted that when God returns and asks questions about their sin, Adam and Eve accuse one another for why they participated in sin, pointing out that Adam and Eve were in the midst of death and in the midst of hell. Luther continued, Unless hearers are given courage through trust, in, excuse me, unless hearers are given courage through trust and mercy, this nature cannot be urged on beyond this point. Thesis nine highlights Luther's sense that sinners are incapable of repentance until we are given courage through trust and mercy. Accusing others is an ever ready response to sin. The finger pointers might be nations or denominations, cities or congregations, women or men. All are in need of coming to know God's mercy and grace for us to move away from accusations of others to places where we might truly be encouraged to repent and reform our communal and personal practices and teachings so that they bear witness to God's grace towards sinners. So Thesis 9 maintains repentance arises from God's grace and its encouragement. And a question it poses is, how ought Christians as individuals and as members of the Church Catholic reform and transform our practices and teachings so that we witness to the mercy of God who moves us from despair and accusation to love of neighbor far and near, different and related? A great gift from Luther and the Protestant Reformation is the teaching that Christian repentance involves the whole of each person's life and is the hallmark of the life of Christian communities. The nine theses I have presented propose ways to retrieve that legacy and receive it as a call for the ongoing turning of the church Catholic and its members. Christian practices and theological teachings need reform and even transformation in light of God's mercy and in light of the pastoral concerns of the 21st century. Thank you for your attentive listening. I look forward to our conversation. Everybody is so amazingly obedient and yet we are Protestants. Meaning we have so much time that we have time for a couple of questions now. Yes. Yeah, Amy. Okay. I wanted to 
ask about Thesis 5. Um, what kinds of diversity of practice and thought you might have in mind? Because I'm thinking about um, how some that involve practices, it can be an either or, right? Will you allow inclusive language for God and worship or will you not, for example, or women's ordination or not? And when I'm teaching Western religions and we're on Judaism, I find it really interesting to think about the Western wall as an example of this because, uh, you know, right now there's not a place for reform and conservative Jewish women to bring Torah scrolls. It's not that they can just go off to their own private space and do worship their own way. That's a shared Jewish space and they have to make a decision, right? So I'm wondering if you can say more about what kinds of diversity and debate, what, what the, what, what the, where, the, where the limits might be on that or what kind you're thinking of. Car, um, I think I think different uh, members of the body of Christ, and by this I'm thinking of communal members, uh, understand the limits of diversity in different ways. Um, so I would want to offer some way to respect uh, the communal decision and discernment making around that, rather than make a kind of a global. Um, and universal statement about it. Um, so I guess that the calls for diversity and the calls for debate and discernment really go um, together in many ways so that contexts matter. Uh, um, one of the things I love about the word context is that it uh, relates to that um, the sense of weaving and where you have long and short threads um, so that you can think of questions of diversity and the limits. Um, what to how, how far can it be without being church dividing in terms of you know what are those kind of long sinews or long yarns that are part of that tapestry um, and what are the shorter more variable so it, it really you get to that question of what's adiaphora um, and what is not thank you anybody else <laughs> Chris uh, uh, regarding thesis number two I wonder if you could say a word about the um, issue of corporate repentance when it comes to the matter of Lutheran engagement with Anabaptists. Um, that was one of the most fraught relationships in the 16th century, and it's one in which the 21st century has seen real, real change. Yes. Uh, in fact, I heard a fascinating paper um, who li uh, the author lifted that tremendous occasion of really a ritual enactment of Lutherans being on their knees um, asking for forgiveness um, as a part of the uh, centered in a liturgical act. She wondered uh, why the, could we use that model for other forms of repentance uh, so that you're actually embodying um, in the concrete ways rather than just textually uh, writing an apology but actually embodying liturgically, ritually. Um, so I, I really I thought that was a fascinating point she was making. So thanks for bringing it up, Amy. Anybody else? You made me think of something that we, when we talk about repentance, we have been thinking of repentance as something that I as an individual do. And as you were speaking, I kept thinking repentance as a communal mm -hmm. activity. Which is, th which is a different way of thinking about that. Maybe easier for some Protestants to engage that word repentance when it's thought of communally rather than uh, uh, falling back to what Luther had so much angst about, that how much can I repent that I'm good with God, but repentance in a totally different light, as you present. Yeah, I think that's really important because I think that it would move some of these discussions off of that kind of individualist sensibility that Amy Planning Kapow was talking about into the, uh, the sense of the communal ownership. And I can see congregations, uh, especially um, you think in the ELCA, the predominance of white people in the ELCA and what might conversations about racism look like if people were scripting uh, kind of um, pu public acts of repentance and thinking about the, their own participation in the racism of our globe and our own country. Thank you. Dennis. Chris, thank you. I uh, agree with everything you said about repentance. I only find it a little bit uh, 
discomforting to, uh, for you to connect this with the 95 Theses. Because as it's been pointed out many times this year that Luther repudiated and repented for his 95 Theses. Two and a half years later, he said, uh, I wish you would get all the printers and all the booksellers would gather the, everything I've written on indulgences together and put it all in one big bonfire. I was wrong, totally wrong, he says, two and a half years later. So he repents for everything he said, not only what he says about indulgences, but everything he says in the 95 Theses, two and a half years later in the, the Babylonian captivity. And uh, so it's a, a little funny that you uh, connect all his very wonderful stuff about repentance to the 95 Theses, which he repudiated. It's always good for a theologian to be in conversation with a historian. <laughs> um, thank you, Dennis Jantz. Uh, I think the onset for my work on this uh, was thinking about why 1517? You know, that kind of question of historical periodization. And so um, that's what really launched the project. It was thinking about 1517, if, if we call that the on onset of the Reformation, um, why are we doing that? And so uh, thinking about um, retrieving the move of repentance and trying to open it up into the ways that I was doing. Um, I also think it's really important to um, look at the ways we have to repent for our own uh, situation. So if, um, in Luther's case, that's a wonderful example of somebody uh, actually changing their own mind. Uh, um, and that's a, a wonderful thing for me in classrooms to lift up, as well as I think in churches where we can actually lift up models of people changing their opinions. So thank you for your point. Thank you. We'll hold the rest of the questions for later, but it's the half time, so we can stand up if you want to. I wish we had music, but we don't, but if you can stand, if you want to hand, stand up and stretch, we have two more wonderful papers ahead of us and discussion time. This is not mandatory, but if you want to keep your blood circulating. <clears throat> All right, that's enough. <laughs> let's, let's get back with our program. Our um, next speaker is Dr. Cornelis van der Kooi from Rije Universiteit from Amsterdam, Europe. And he's an author in the field of Christian systematics. You may have read his co-authored Christian systematics and I hope he says something more about that. And one of his publications includes Als in Ein Spiegel, God, Kennen, Wolken, Calvin, and Barth, and Tveluik, which means as if in a mirror, knowing God with Calvin and Barth, approximately. So I'm asking Dr. Van der Kooi to again tell us what excites him about Reformation and highlight some of his recent work, and we welcome. Maybe um, I have to disappoint you that uh, the, I, I don't know so much of whether I, I find really the Reformation exciting. Um, it is uh, so, um, I think you will hear in my presentation what I think of it. Uh, of course, it was a surprise, it was a, a, the, the Reformation, the historical Reformation ca came as a surprise. Uh, they didn't expect it, and um, so maybe uh, what uh, what does excite me is that the real reformations in life you cannot organize it, but they are a gift, and that is something. So reformation cannot be a program. I think theologically, I would say that it cannot be a program that we have to, um, um, yeah, to, um, uh, to, 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 to make true. Uh, and about that book, um, I am, so yes, I'm teaching at the Freie Universiteit, that is uh, Dutch pronunciation, um, 
we are not allowed longer to say free university because uh, people think that, that there will be no payment, yeah, no tuition. Uh, so Freie Universiteit. Um, and um, yes, I have uh, co-authored with uh, my, um, my colleague Gijsbert van der Brink, Christian Dogmatics. It was published in 2012 in Dutch, went through several prints. And um, yes, that book on Calvin and Karl Barth, as in a mirror, knowing God according to Karl Barth and uh, John Calvin and Karl Barth. And, um, yeah, and also I, 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 I want to s tell you here, uh, of course, um, my Warfield lectures, they are published now, uh, this incredibly benevolent force, uh, that's the title, that's the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, the Holy Spirit um, um, uh, in Reformed Theology and Spirituality. But the most, um, um, I would say, exciting thing was that I um, co-authored a book with my wife. My wife is a chaplain in the hospital. Four years ago, she gave a lecture on why should a chaplain read dogmatics? And um, so we were stimulated to make work of that, and we have uh, worked it out. Um, um, we have um, elaborated on that, and um, um, it is now in Dutch available. So there she has her pastoral experiences, and I have given there a systematic uh, reflection on how systematic theology is only a toolkit, and not more than that, and um, steers what you say and what you do not want to say. So uh, systematic theology has a very moderate um, position, I would say. Uh, it is not unimportant, but it is not life itself. It is not the hike. It is um, at most a hiking guide. And you not always are looking in your hiking guide because that will be dangerous if you do that. So. Uh, but, okay, let me now go to my presentation. And the title is, maybe disappointing for you, but why not join the Roman Catholic Church? That's the title. Why not join the Roman Catholic Church? Of course, the title is an ambivalent one and on purpose. It can be read as a rhetorical question. Why should we refrain from joining the Church of Rome when there are so many good reasons to make this step? In the last years, quite a lot of people, and among them quite a lot of evangelicals, have made this decision. From a Reformed and evangelical perspective, there have been many changes in this church, in the Roman Catholic Church, that have caused an rapprochement. However, the title can also be read differently as an argument not to join this church. Why? not join the Roman Catholic Church. I want to elaborate on both, on both possibilities, and of course I will make some remarks on the choice that we can make. Let me start to say that historically Protestantism never had the intention to start a new church. It started as a movement to reform the church, to bring it back to the gospel and message of Jesus Christ, and both sides, the reformers and their counterparts from the Roman Catholic side, agreed that the church had to be one and should not be divided over different confessions. So all those disputations uh, are clear in that, uh, in that way. So Protestantism is historically accidental and never meant to found a confession that essentially has a different foundation. So in that way, that we say reformed or Lutheranism, that is not in the mindset, was not in the mindset of Luther, Calvin, neither Swingley. So I think that this historical judgment implies a serious statement for the status of the reformed churches or the Protestant churches of our times. The Protestant churches have to regard themselves as an emergency measure. And one characteristic of an emergency measure is that they are not meant for eternity, but that they are timely. 
Hopefully there will be a time in which the necessity for an emergency measure is no longer valuable. And my question today is, has that time come? There have been times in which the step back to the Roman Catholic Church was frequently done. Quite a lot of people around John Calvin returned to the old church, like his friend Louis Dutier, and later Pierre Caroli, who criticized Calvin and Farrell for not sticking to the Trinity. It was a time in which the frontiers were not yet set, not set yet. The line between Roman Catholic and the Reform Reformation was a moving one, sometimes thin and dependent on political decisions, power issues, and so on. The frontiers were not firm before 1648, the Peace of Westphalen or Münster, that finally ended what is called the 80 Years War. Uh, an interesting time also for uh, uh, transitions or conversions is also the beginning of the 19th century. I only mention here the name of John Henry Newman as a wonderful example. Uh, and in the Netherlands, um, um, uh, in, in the, after the World War II, in my country, in the Netherlands, we had also some very um, uh, famous transitions. One of them, um, uh, uh, Philip Beer became himself a bishop. And also in the United States are, of course, famous examples of, uh, of converts like the politician Newt Gingr Gingrich, difficult to pronunciate, the author Graham Greene, and of course a bunch of people um, that we can call evangelical Catholics like Richard John Newhouse. Um, I think we have to be honest that the state of the Roman Catholic Church is by no means n now, is by no means to compare with the state that this church had under the Renaissance popes. Um, so what th does that mean? Um, because soon that church began to took up the globe, and if we talk about reformations, then we have to see what kind of reformations within the Roman Catholic Church itself have been started and implemented. Um, I can think also Trente is a, is, a, is a cleansing of the church. And of course, uh, and I think that process has gone, uh, was going on, has been continued. And the Second Vatican Council um, can be evaluated as an acknowledgement of some of the objections from the Protestant side. So they have become closer historically. I think after 500 years, we have to, con to make that conclusion. The steps made towards the practices of the Reformation were in fact huge. From now on, it was allowed to celebrate the Mass in the ver vernacular. The church was no longer regarded as a state, but more emphasis was given to the community of the church as the people of God. That was a new element and caused a shift in emphasis. It created new space for the laity. It was an opening for renewal movements like the charismatic movement, Focolare, women, and San Egidio. The intention for scripture for reading the Bible became more important. As to the issue of revelation, the step was made that tradition and Bible as word of God were taken together, and a clear opposition between tradition and scripture was rejected. So, okay, uh, nevertheless, the idea of a successio apostolorum was maintained as an essential element of orthodox doctrine. Um, but um, I think important has also been in our situation that the popes uh, have got a much more positive press. If, you, if we look at the, uh, the last two popes, then I think uh, even Protestants could be uh, proud of these representatives of Christianity. At least I had that idea. And the last pope, of the, the pope now, Francis, of course, is a star in uh, many respects. Um, but a more principal reason to join the Roman Catholic Church is that in the 
episcopal system, the bishop has a function to present the unity of the church. There is one person locally and maybe even universally which can say something on behalf of that church. The issue of ministry and particularly the possibility of a bishop is an issue that in the wake of the Lima report on baptism, Eucharist and ministry from 1982 is also seriously, seriously discussed within Protestant theology and also in Busan towards a common uh, understanding of the church. Um, uh, this element of the office has been um, uh, put on the agenda again. Um, as to the question of the unity of the church, stemming from the Reformation, um, uh, the Reformation had an obvious disadvantage. The, our churches are divided, if not separated, in denominations, and these denominations are often nationally organized. The continuation of splits is nothing less than a disease. It should be asked, is the Church of Christ in its essence organized along borders of nation, of ethnic background, or even of language? There's only one church who is really transnational, and this is the Roman Catholic Church. In Rome, in front of the St. Peter, this becomes clear every Sunday and every Wednesday. People from all the nations gather there, sing their songs, worship in their own language, but are nevertheless one in that they belong to the visible Roman Catholic Church. What a difference with the Protestant denominations, not to speak of the divisions in the evangelical and Pentecostal world. The, caric the caricature of the evangelical dividedness is articulated by the saying, then I started my own church. There are quite a, a lot of evangelicals who have converted to the Roman Catholicism just because this disease, they were fed up with it. And let us be honest, it is a disease that often boils down to the effect that faith and church members decease. As you know, the unity of the church is particularly located in the Pope as a successor of Peter. Notwithstanding the shift that was brought by Vatican II in Lumen Gentium by speaking so much and immediately on the church as the people of God and the pilgrimage of this people, notwithstanding the fact that the order of bishops is mentioned as a subject of the highest and complete power over the church, it is again assured that the final ecclesial power has its apex or apex stone or keystone in the papacy. Hereby, the dogmatic constitution Pastor Eternus from 1870 was confirmed. This location of the authority in the Roman Catholic Church in the papacy is one of the best examples of a church that has its pillar in the concept of office. It has, and I think that is true, has a wonderful clarity and is only therefore already attractive. It is quite different from the practice in most of the Reformed churches, let alone the evangelical churches where the concept of office is much less clear. Where is the authority in the Reformed churches located? Officially, the authority is located in the consistory with the elders and deacons, but is it true? Maybe it was true in some time in which we had elders who knew the confession of the church and who were immersed in the Bible, but in my country that is only true for some churches. Or is the authority in fact located in one charismatic pastor? minister, in, as in many free churches and neo-Pentecostal neo -Pentecostal churches? Or is it located in the financial, financial committee that takes care of the financial business of the church? Reformed the theologians have obviously become more sympathetic with an episcopal model. I mention here my uh, countryman Bram van der Beek. Um, um, he he, uh, yeah, he, he, argue, he gives an argument that um, a historical uh, argue, argument um, in which um, in the writings of the apostolic fathers, the people are summoned to listen to their bishop. And also for the reformed churches, it should be true that the office is given by God as an gegenüber of the congregation. So one of the central issues is the Christ representation here, and I think that is also the theological uh, yeah, um, stone, uh, cornerstone, or 
uh, also something that, that many people and many Protestants do not like, and particularly Barthian theologians mostly deeply disagree here. Um, okay, so um, I uh, skip something. Um, m maybe I, uh, uh, I also want to uh, say the, the, the Roman Catholic Church has, of course, its clarity that there is an objectivity of grace. Um, um, it, is, it is given to you in the whole idea of the uh, reservatio, the reservation of bread and wine in the tabernacle. That is clear, the, the, the mystery of the presence of Christ through the Holy Spirit is real in, um, in bread and wine, in the transubstantiation. Um, so, the presentia realis. I think there we have the, uh, the most difficult um, uh, edge or the line, the dividing line between uh, Reformed and Lutheran thought and Roman Catholic thought. The objectivity that is given us in, um, in Christ. I also want to emphasize with John W. Nevin in the 19th century and with other scholars that uh, Calvin, the depending on, uh, has uttered himself much more Roman Catholic oriented and really um, was a supporter of the uh, presentia realis. He believed in the presence of power, the virtus of the eternal life that springs from Jesus Christ as fountain of God's grace. Uh, so um, grace is exposed there also for Calvin to the senses there is still an objectivity, of course. It is mediated by the Holy Spirit and therefore spiritualiter, but nevertheless, it is exposed in the objectivity of the Holy Spirit. Um, or do we have to say that Calvin, by making um, that, that in Calvin's thought, grace is received by faith. If there is no faith, no hand stretch out to receive in humbleness, then nothing is received. Bread and wine left over from the Holy Spirit do mean nothing, no reservatio. Um, is here, uh, does Calvin here, uh, has he, um, uh, uh, has he transcended, uh, or has he given into a kind of subjectivity, subjectivity, subjectivism? Uh, of course, here all the um, accusations of Calvin as giving into modernity to the centrality of the human subject come in. Um, I go on. Um, so uh, why not the um, Roman? Why not join, join the Roman Catholic Church? Um, the many of the. Um, objections that the, re re that the reformers had, the problems uh, that caused the Reformation have taken, have been taken away. So what does that mean? Or is there that we say uh, there is one deep objection and that is that the uh, connection between Christ and the church, spirit and church, is identified in the Roman Catholic Church too much. And also Ratzinger in his later years has gone that way. Um, particularly in the orbit um, uh, of Barthian theology frequently is warned for a theology in which the Holy Spirit is claimed uh, by the office bearers of the church such a theology leads to an abuse of authority and power and that does not bring to Christ but is a barrier. Um, so here our theology of the Holy Spirit I think is the uh, issue that we have to uh, retrieve and have to bring in 
to discussion with the Roman Catholic Church. Um, what is the connection? Um, in, I think, in my, in my theology, I would say we always have to pray for the Holy Spirit. He is never our possession. Roman Catholics will also say that, but nevertheless, the Spirit, Christ, is more identified, objectified, given in the church, in the institution itself. Uh, of course, the famous um, uh, change from est in subsisted is here the, um, the, the example of the difference. And there may be space in that subsisted also for the, uh, re for the Protestant churches. We are under a promise. We receive blessings. Um, but uh, we have even people with a special command, task, and therefore auth 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 authority. But this, the office, I think, in Reformed the and Protestant theology could be taken far more serious as nowadays in most Protestant churches is done. When the consistory has to function as a kind of episcopacy, then, for example, the censura morum and the mutual visitation between congregations should be installed as a real counseling. And here, I think, I can link up with uh, what Amy Pau uh, says, that um, there should be an, an ongoing kind of uh, consultation. But it is even ad advisable, I think, to take the episcopal model more seriously here. Now local churches suffer sometimes from situations in which problems were concealed and surfaced too late. Can we locate and objectify the Holy Spirit in the way the Roman Catholic Church has done in its view on office? As final remark, I, give, I close with the, with the question that Karl Barth asked when he was invited to Vatican II in a meeting with other pre, prelates, prelates. Uh, Joseph Ratzinger, then Rose, Joseph Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict, spoke on the church. He spoke for a considerable time and could mention wonderful things about the church. After a while, Barth reacted. We Protestants stand, so quote, we Protestants stand completely poor alongside this wealth, Herr Ratzinger. But why did you until now not speak, at least not explicitly, on the Holy Spirit? And for what reason does the tradition such a dominating role for the Roman Catholic play such a dominating role for the Roman Catholic Church, does this somehow stem from fear for the Holy Spirit? My dear Herr Ratzinger, lieber Herr Ratzinger, might it be that your church, in fact, is on the run for the Holy Spirit? Abraham Bush tells that this question was embarrassing and big enough not immediately to reject. Now, okay, so this is... Um, what I had to say on reformations and why not and why m maybe maybe not join the Roman Catholic Church, but I'm I'm wavering. So, <laughs> we have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Yes, Christopher first. Uh, not yet. No, not Christopher. There's somebody else. Anthony Elsewhere. Uh, thank you, Professor von der Goy. Um, you framed your, your uh, paper in terms of a question, why should we not join the Roman Catholic Church? Uh, you dwelled on ecclesiological issues almost exclusively. I would be interested in your comments uh, on uh, issues of faith and grace. Luther congratulated Erasmus uh, that he didn't take issue with him on issues which were secondary yet important. Uh, but that he singled out by faith alone. Um, I'm wondering if there is a reason uh, that we should or should not join the Roman Catholic Church in terms of the debate that Martin Luther congratulated Erasmus for framing so well. Um, if, I, if I understand you well, then 
this is much better than that uh, microphone, I have the idea. But um, also, uh, the whole issue of the justification by faith, of the justification of the sinner, uh, we have made much progress in that uh, debate. So is that, is that not, is that something that really is dividing? Eh? Uh, we, we have come to an understanding that that might be no longer a dividing point. Um, in the time of Luther and Calvin, yes. But therefore, an emergency measure. But as I said, it might be that we have now come in a time in which that holding to this emergency measure um, is no longer responsible. And at least we have not, we are so used that we are reformed or that we are Lutherans and maybe we are proud that we are Lutherans or that we that we are reformed, yeah? So, but here, what is in the name? Do we call us to, after a human being, Luther, or Calvinist, after a human being? Oh no, Calvinists do, usually do not call themselves, mention themselves after a human being. They say reformed. But so, um, I would make uh, the Protestants a little bit nervous about sticking to this emergency measure. Argola von Grumba has this famous saying that um, I am not Lutheran while she's defending Luther and Lutheran teaching, but I am a Christian. So that's a wise word from a mother from the 16th century. Else Marie Wiebeck Pedersen, you had a comment, Else Marie? Uh, I have one comment and a question of clarification. First, the comment. Your initial question was, uh, why not join the Catholic Church and not, why not join the Roman Catholic Church? So, my comment to your initial question would be, at least I don't know about the Reformed, but as a Lutheran, I would say it is the Catholic Church, and that is why Article 7 of the, uh, the Augsburg Confession really actually is shaping and functioning as the most ecumenical pattern which is used globally. Uh, my question of clarification has to do with uh, the fact that I heard you say the 80th year, the 80 year war that ended in 1648. Now, I know about a 30-year war, so I would like to know uh, what the other one is. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I have to apologize for uh, mixing up, for not being uh, precise enough. We all regard ourselves as part of the Catholic Church. I, I call myself a Reformed Catholic. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think that also f for a long time, um, until 1648, also on the Protestant side, Lutherans and r the Reformed uh, parties or representatives felt embarrassed and uneasy that there was such a split uh, in Europe, in the church. They did not like it. And my objection and my problem with contemporary Protestantism is that we are satisfied with that. We do not find, we do not feel a problem and particularly many evangelicals and Pentecostals do not feel a problem here at all. I think that is not Catholic. Not Catholic in the wider sense that you say. 
Um, and then you had an, a clarification. Uh, yeah, the 80 year old war. 80 year old war. 80 year old war. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. That, that is a typical uh, Dutch and Flemish uh, uh, way of, of, of looking at this terrible time. Um, uh, we, 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 we in our country speak about the 80th war, 80 years war that started in 1568 uh, when the Spanish tried to, um, yeah, to, to, uh, to pacify the low countries in quite a cruel way. There it started, and then if you count further, you come to uh, to 80. But I know that the 30 Years' War was um, in cruelty beyond the 80 Years' War. This is a good reminder how, in Europe, the different countries have a little bit of their own narrative about the, what are oh, the yes. most important days and all that. We have to ask the other questions. I'm not even looking at you. Hold off, uh, hold on to them, and we'll ask you, uh, Mary and Hans, immediately after the presentations, to you come forward with your questions. But I want to honor our um, uh, fourth presenter, uh, Dr. Evangeline Anderson Raikumar from Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, more specifically, currently pastoring in Corridon, Indiana, while she's from India. How what a coincidence in Indiana, well, she's actually from India. Uh, over the years, she has taught at the United Theological College in Bangalore and Serambore College in India, at the Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia, and the Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary in Columbia, South Carolina, in the US. Her writings are mostly on body theology, and she addresses patterns of patriarchy, race, caste, and gender issues with an overarching concern for justice. And I'm asking you also, uh, Doctor, uh, to talk about your excitement with Reformation, whether it's good or bad, and highlight some of your work, please. Welcome. Thank you very much. Let me begin by saying that Reformation 500 years ago, how it traveled across time and space, and how it is experienced as a living faith tradition, everyday spirituality in India is something to celebrate. We have 12 different churches within the family of the Lutheran umbrella, and each of them having their own mother congregations in different parts of the world. So it is different church boards, missions that formed these 12 different Lutheran churches, which comes under the umbrella of United Evangelical Lutheran Churches in India. The way they celebrated 500 years of Reformation, I'm sure, would not have been done in any other part of the world, perhaps maybe in some country, maybe in Namibia, but just that festive celebration of Reformation. And this makes you raise that question, what is it about Reformation that excites even today, people across the world, and I would like to specifically re refer to Indian Christian communities. And there I would say that it includes people who are quote unquote literate and also those who have made it their faith by memorizing hymns, the Lutheran hymns, the Lutheran prayers, and they have made it as part and parcel of their everyday spirituality and life. How did this happen? I believe that Luther's contribution, Luther's 
pointing to that Christ who embraces all, Luther pointing to that God, that God's grace that includes all, lies at the base of it all. So that aspect of inclusivism is so particular in Lutheran theology, and I believe that could be one of the reasons why people flock to the churches, and the Lutheran church is a growing church. And that also brings me to connect how I, as a Lutheran, raised as a Lutheran Christian for three generations, I'm here, and I believe once again, it's the grace of God. And yes, God's ways are mysterious. And for us to contribute to that task of unveiling this grace of Christ, unmasking powers, abusive powers, and participating in that protest movements across the world. I would like to make a kind of a tweak to this title, Reformation and Reformations, and instead of spending moments to thread together all the reasons as to why there could be a space for nostalgia around 500 years of Reformation, I would like to place the risks and challenges before us if we fail to respond to the cries for Reformation that we hear around, within, and amongst us in the theological and political climate of our times. Here is a moment rife for us to pause and ask a few preliminary questions about Reformation then and now. Let me begin with the familiar now and I ask this question. What did it take for the 2.6 million people, mostly women, across all ages, color, race, creed, class, sex and sexuality, sexual orientation, what did it take for them March on the streets of Washington on January 21, 2017, and in other cities in the US, as well as across the world. Was it a case of efficient organizing, availability of funds and other resources? Was it a mark of success of social media? How long did it take for the passion of justice to spread from one body to another, from one part of the world to another? Was it only the result of the election in the US? Or was it simmering for a long time where women put up with violence against their bodies? When the hashtag Me Too was not yet a moment in women's movement. What is it that gave all those women, and of course all those who supported the cause of gender justice that includes men, what gave them the impetus to travel on their own using their own resources? Was it a matter of finally finding their voice that final birth-giving push for the life of the movement to be born into the world as a new babe of hope? As that child who instantly gained her feet and started walking and marching and singing and crying out on the streets for justice, the spirit of global solidarity was unmistakable. I believe that the questions of priority would have changed for the women. 
the tipping point for their readiness to come together was their oneness in suffering of pain and humiliation in their bodies. Their silence became a voice, a cry, a shout for justice. It seemed to be the fulfillment of no one needed to teach one's neighbor, know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest, a knowledge given by God. Jeremiah 31, 34. When the common experience, common right of human dignity is denied, and when this pain experienced in one part of the body, read as somebody, somebody, is experienced by every other part of the body that is functioning in the global body of solidarity, I see the white blood corpuscles of the global solidarity body rising as one to fight against the disease of patriarchy experienced in this part of the world. The global solidarity for justice is not imagined. It is real. It is the sign of hope for the resurrection of the body. Something that happens not only when the body is dead, but when it is dying because of hatred. This military power of the white blood corpuscles of this global body of solidarity does not depend on trade and possession of arms and ammunition, nuclear or otherwise. It does not depend on the notion of security hidden in gun rights. The white blood corpuscles of the global body identifies the bacteria in the form of patriarchy with all its tentacled and camouflaged mammonic body linked with racism, sexism, xenophobia. I see the tipping point for the March on Washington which I would name as a reformation march of our times, was based on the commonness of experience of pain, rather than the luxury of mulling over the difference as if it is outside our bodies to be differentially valorized. It was the aspiration for this common minimum prerequisite of human dignity for all, that spirit was powerful enough to give birth to the babe of global solidarity for justice. From the now, let me move on to the then, the past then, before and after Reformation 500 years ago. For example, what did it take for the common people to respond to the quest for reformation that was waiting in the wings for a long time? Reformation did not happen overnight. What then was the tipping point or points for reformation to happen then? I am reminded of Arundhati Roy, a well-known Indian writer who says, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. Maybe many of us won't be there to greet her, on a, but on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Did Martin Luther hear the dancing feet of reformation? Or was it the bang, bang, thud of his faith and experience, rereading of the scriptures and finding that eureka moment of justification 
by grace through faith? I can only imagine that on the scales, at one end of the spectrum stood the loud silence and the spirit of liberation for justice, simmering all the time in history as if a volcano ready to erupt. At the other end of the scales of the spectrum, the glaring impunity enjoyed by those who abused power, who had normalized corruption within the church and other institutions of their time. People were so much immersed in questions such as, what can I do to gain eternal life, moksha? How can I be worthy of the title, good and faithful servant? This question seems to be a ubiquitous question in all faiths, all religions. When one's eyes are fixed on the afterlife, not suffering in the purgatory, not wanting their beloved ancestors to burn in hell, it is actually an individualistic craving for salvation. As if salvation was a product to purchase, as if salvation was a goal to achieve. Their love for individualistic salvation and piety was strong enough to make them unconscious, if not ignorant, of the selfish mammon of patriarchy colluding with the institution of the market, economics, and religion combined. The trust that people had on religion per se, on the religious per se, was such that they made these congruous with salvation. When patriarchy manages to win over, pull wool over the eyes of the people, and in my context, the poor, the Dalits, the women, and many other marginalized bodies in this world, in the name of religion and in collusion with the market, the meaning of trust and love for the church loses its meaning. Each one feels individually let down by the church, by respective religion or the religious. The pain borne by individual bodies, as if it is their own pain which they have to bear alone out of shame. But when that pain in every body is shared and diagnosed, when shame part of the cause of the disease in, is unmasked, that gives enough spirit for the individual suffering bodies to come together and to allow that blood of freedom and justice and quest for liberation to flow in each other's veins and become one whole body of cells. When Martin Luther pointed out to the people that they gained nothing by their individual piety, that there was something radically wrong in their understanding of the source of grace, power of God, and love. That is a moment for people to change their understanding of individualistic salvation to utter grace of God. It was a moment of dissolving of all the shame affixed on individual and collective bodies, the present and absent bodies, the female and the male bodies. In other words, the absolute common availability of God's grace for all 
was the hermeneutical key for reformation. In people's quest for salvation, it was not to be gained through one's own works, but by the absolute commonness of God's grace. In other words, the tipping point for reformation to become history here and now was to experience the democratization of God's unconditional grace for all, regardless. In Indian context, there have been several moments of hearing the feet of the one coming, bringing the glad news of justice and liberation. You can hear her coming on a day, but not so quiet. One filled with cries for justice, that's the cries that are drowned in the noise of Hindutva and Brahminism. For centuries now, casteism tried to make the Dalits believe that their bodies are somehow flawed, that their blood is somehow polluted, that they have to seek their liberation within the paradigm set for them by the casteist folk. For decades and centuries, the cries of people crying with pain and shame about their bodies was not only heard within them, contained and controlled within them by the casteist state, as well as casteist elements in every religious institution, including the church. Dalit struggles for liberation were simmering and their cries quivering on the lips and burning as the fire shut up in their bones. Bhim Rao Ambedkar, who is called as the father of Indian constitution, I believe was an instrument handpicked by God. Not a Buddhist God, not a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian God, but by God to be that reformer of our times to be that catalyst to bring about change and reformation within the society. I'm sure many would even ask the spelling of his name, of this great human being, who's been a source of inspiration for many social reformers, including our Martin Luther King. But the sound of the feet of Dalit liberation is constantly hushed and brushed aside by the noisy, violent trampling of their lives. And here I refer to one of the greatest marches in Indian history that took place even just last year in 2016 in the same state of Gujarat where, Ma where Mahatma Gandhi had his own great march of the salt satyagraha. I conclude with these words. Global solidarity for justice is the key to reformation. We are in a context where peace is sold in the form of guns, love is sold in the form of life insurance, and justice is sold in the form of right to possess nuclear arms, right to plunder the earth of her blood and life, right to be violent if we have to protect our territorial integrity, it comes in the name of so-and-so first. It comes within the language of let us make God in the image of human being. The bottom line for reformation is this. There is no place, no scope for individualistic anything, be it spirituality, piety, or any right. It can only be that which connects every body, and I mean every body. Thank you. I think we just experienced the power of the word, <laughs> proclaimed word. Thank you. We could take one or two questions first, and then we ask, I ask Mary and Hans to get to your questions to um, the third speaker. Would anybody have a question immediately about the fourth paper? No? 
Okay. I want to thank you for an excellent paper, very uh, well read, very intense, very thoughtful, and I just really appreciated the words you had to share. Um, I wonder if I, if I could push and think through some of your, your thoughts a little bit here. As, as I think you're pointing to um, a sense of unity, let's say, uh, amongst Christians, non-Christians, folks of various faiths around this concern for justice. Um, being in some slight contrast to the previous paper, uh, less of a focus on polity or structures, more of a focus on a, a concept or, or an idea or a value. So my question is, I'm just, I'm just curious to know what happens when we, when we lack unity on, on our objects or concerns for justice. You point to the Women's March, you point to the concern for Dalit liberation, uh, but clearly we live in a society that's still quite polarized and there are, are serious disagreements about what counts as reformation for justice and what is a reenacting of injustices, new and old. Uh, so I'm just curious to, to hear your thoughts on how do we find unity even when the object of, of concern, the object of justice, is one that's deeply, uh, deeply polarized. Thank you. I believe, I believe that these moments of reformation have their own intensity at different times in history. Those who marched on Washington on January 21st, where are they now? And what is their stand when it comes to, for example, Roy Moore's case? Or many other incidents where passion for justice is hidden, distorted, within that umbrella of identity within a particular party, or it, it invents new boundaries and new things where you feel that you have to be loyal to something much more than your passion for justice. You know, kind of in new inventing of barriers, new structures that are imagined, which constantly divide people. And I believe our sense of hope increases each time we find people finding their voice. Even after 40 years, there is no question like, why did they remember only after 40 years? One voice recalling the memory, powerful. So we search for signs of unity, not in everybody coming together, even one body coming together, somebody coming together is a sign of hope. And it is towards that concept of unity. Thank you. So now, Mary and Hans, you had a question to our um, third speaker, I believe. Thank you. I could now, after the fourth paper, say, um, yes, the third speaker was the prompt for it, but I think um, I would like to hear something from everybody, if possible. So I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but you had said um, that many of the questions that divided the church have now been answered to some satisfaction, and you expressed a concern for unity and authority. I believe that there are new questions that divide us, and many of these have developed because of the reformers' way of understanding um, scripture and doctrine of God, doctrine of Jesus Christ. Um, and I'll give you an example, and then refer to some points from the other three speakers. Uh, at the end of August, I was in Brazil at a gender congress that was held at the Lutheran Seminary there. I spoke with a woman from El Salvador who is a lay leader and in seminary, and she referred to the way that Roman Catholic teaching, so theological anthropology, has infused the way that the local priests um, counsel families and m to be appropriate men and appropriate women and continues to maintain violence against women at times. 
Um, to me, we have, for example, as um, both a theology of ministry and theological anthropology that are questions that divide us. So to refer to what um, Amy said that uh, Calvin's concern for Reformation was not to escape the church, but to be honest about what a mess we can make of it. So I think there's a point of connection there. Chris, you referred to repentance involves reforming and transforming teachings regarding women. How does that belong to all of us, not just to Protestants? And Evangeline, you expressed in a very clear but implicit way a, a challenge back to the third speaker about the concern for every endpoint body end point. So thank you for your comments. Thank you. Would you like to respond? I want to add to that. Ordination of women, I mean, as long as the Roman Catholic Church does not ordain women, most of us Protestant women who are ordained just cannot join the Roman Catholic Church, even if we wanted to. That's why I said theology. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, I think it comes it boils down to a point of difference that I pointed to. Namely, um, in the identification between the possession of the Holy Spirit or of Christ and that the institution of that very church, of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I think in a uh, Protestant, at least in a Calvinistic, uh, pneumatology, more pneumatolo pneumatological understanding of uh, our pilgrimage, there we are never in possession of the Holy Spirit, we can only ask for, and that links up, I think, uh, theologically. So, I, what I did was making a theological point, and I can easily uh, bring that as a denominator uh, for your ob objection. I think if we, so uh, the, the, the division between um, the reformed of the, reform the, the reformed traditions now, Protestant, Lutheran, etc., and the Roman Catholic Church is exactly, in theological terms, the relation between institution, church, and spirit, Christ, on the other side. Is there uh, identification? Is, is it possessed? Is it located and identified with the office? Or not? Okay, so... Uh, and, and, and I would uh, argue myself for a pneumatological, more an eschatological um, uh, perspective on our church. And that also includes that churches have to learn. Um, Amy um, said that she gave a wonderful example of the way Calvin did it that Calvin uh, said there are uh, changing uh, situations. And um, so there, there, there should be a self-criticism of the church. And even Calvin um, endeavored to criticize Paul, which was, of course, amazing that he, that he d did that. So I agree with you, but, but your, your ex example will not um, dismiss my point. I would say uh, it, is an, it is an example, it is an example of the identification of the Roman Catholic Church with a particular understanding of office. And that means that also women never will be in office because then the Christ representation can only be done by male. Yeah, okay, so I don't think there is, but you have, it, uh, your, you, you have listened to me in a very practical way, and I have tried, but I failed in that, obviously, um, to, to bring it on a more theological level. Hans, did you want to? 
Hans, did you have a question earlier? You had your hand up. Oh, oh, oh. Who wanted to respond? Did you? Yes, please. I, I, I can say a few things from the perspective of the round 10 of the Lutheran Roman Catholic dialogue, um, because uh, as you so rightfully pointed out, I think the agreement on the doctrine of justification was understood to be um, such a groundbreaking opportunity for um, greater consensus on other teachings, so that we began our dialogue with great hope. Um, but uh, uh, things stumbled uh, in the decade that we met. So uh, I think the, there's great hope that the doctrine of justification would pave for new opportunities. Um, we, t we talked because we were working on the doc uh, teachings about apostolicity, we talked about um, a pre previous rounds work on teaching and, min and ministry uh, in which the question of the ordination of only men was uh, made an appendix. Um, it was, we were instructed that the time in the Roman teachings was so unstable um, that it would not be even advisable for us to make an appendix at this point in time because um, you remember the kinds of silencing that was happening in teaching and writing around the ordination of women um, in Roman Catholic settings um, so that any further movement uh, was perceived possibly to make this an infallible teaching. So Catholics were fearful that to raise the question again would um, bring the church's teaching to a place where it could not be retracted or could not, it hasn't been, <laughs> infallible teachings have not been retracted. So it, it would put it in an unprecedented situation. So I think um, you're, it's a really a sad situation um, uh, in many ways. I think this conversation points out to this, this um, issue. What is a theological question and what is a practical question? And in feminist theology, we've been trying to bridge that gap. So violence against women, ordination of women, it, it can be considered a the theological issue. So I think there's a little bit of a make, 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 mixing, uh, missing each other's points here. Um, or maybe not. But um, I promised earlier, actually, that the panelists can talk to one another. But Hans, I want to ask, uh, have you, uh, Hans, can you ask your question now? And then we let the panelists reflect, and then we open it again to the whole congregation. OK, I try to ask a question. And we're going to keep the I, questions and answers brief. I can't affirm that it will be a question. But for uh, Cornelius van der Kooi, I have one comment. You said justification. That's where we agreed on. Now, if you read the document, at the very end, it says there are some loose ends. That would not be a point where I wonder. But the same year that this document was signed, John Paul II issued a special indulgence. Now, how does that go together? Means, for us, this is the principal point, justification. For Roman Catholics, it seems, it's a point among others. And that really is a big difference. So when you say, well, no, we agreed, we can, did I understand that correctly, return? I don't think we want to return. We want to move forward and hopefully to some kind of reconciled diversity. That's, I don't know whether that's a question. Maybe it's a comment. Yeah. Maybe a brief comment that there yeah, will be. Yeah, uh, very brief. Uh, of course, I, I also know very well Eberhard Jungel's objection to this uh, so-called agreement. Um, so. Uh, I can understand what you what you say, and, and sure, uh, but even even here there is a difference between Karl Barth and the Lutheran uh, statement that the justification of, uh, of of faith is the articulus stantis et cadentis ecclesiae. Yeah. Okay. okay. Did you panelists have a quick reflections to each other reactions, and and while the rest of the congregation, you can think up your questions. 
I'd also like to respond to, to Mary's question. For me, this raises the issue of who speaks for Roman Catholicism. <laughs> Um, so, so certainly there's a kind of monopoly of power and, and, and the, the um, power to articulate what, what church teaching will be seems, seems rather restricted. Um, but when I listen to uh, many Roman Catholics from Asia, for example, um, their understanding of the relationship of the Holy Spirit in this church sounds quite different to me. Than, than, than Western understandings, which, which I think fall closer to what, what Case was talking about. Um, for a long time, I think you could have asked the same question, um, who speaks for Protestantism? And it wasn't women, and, and it wasn't Dalits. <laughs> um, so, so I think part of the, the task of Reformation is to get this larger conversation going in which there's hearing and, and listening but also speaking on, on the parts of, of, of new people and, and there are plenty of Roman Catholics who, who would love that to be true of their church as well. My, very, my quick reflection and response to this question of non-ordination of women in the church in the Roman Catholic church I would say, I wouldn't uh, kind of say it will not happen and put a period after that, but leave it in the open and recognize the already happening events and incidents in the church. For example, the future church within the Roman Catholic faith, how the women have come together to revalidate their preaching and teaching, and I, I'm not sure about the ordination yet. But let me just very quickly put, you know, subject this to an analysis, very quick analysis from the perspective of the body. Women's bodies are required in every religion as the site on which the values of every religion the requirements of every religion are inscribed. And when these women's bodies are controlled, conditioned, and when they are told, no, you can preach, but you cannot celebrate communion, it is actually valuing your speech to say that is okay, that at that time, it will be valued. But when you utter the words of institution, sorry, it will not carry the same value. Nothing will change. Nothing will happen because you're a woman. In other words, it's differentially valuing the value of voice of a woman, even within the theology of sacraments, within the theology of, say, preaching the word and the sacraments. That's just one uh, reflection. And the second is this. There was a workshop, a gender workshop, which I gave for a group of nuns. And in that workshop, the morning session was on the power of women's voice. How do we redeem the power of women's voice? And in the afternoon time, when it was time for worship, I found that when it came to the words of institution, the women who were supposed to stop reading that part along with the priest just went ahead and started reading the whole thing along with the priest. So much so, the priest stopped and looked up, but the women went on reading the words of institution. And the following day was the question, we should, one or two said, we should not have said that. While the rest said, we enjoyed saying it. Amy, Chris, do you have, Amy, Chris, do you want to have a comment? Or? <coughs> Anybody else? Questions, comments? I have a comment. I'm a little nervous because it's not completely formed, and I'm sure you'll correct my 
uh, stating of my issue. And I wonder if the question is not why don't we return to Rome, but rather why doesn't Rome open their doors to us? Luther didn't leave the Roman Catholic Church. He was kicked out. And I can't speak for our Reformed folks. I can't speak for lots of Lutherans. But to have some recognition that maybe Holy Mother Church is not always right would be a good place to start. Just an idea. And of course, we have not, not uh, any official Roman Catholic person here, so we feel like we're talking about somebody. We have nobody here to represent really that, that viewpoint from, a, from the point of view of being a person in practicing that tradition. But uh, anybody want to respond to that quickly? I, I would like to say a couple of things about it. Um, I think the question of who speaks for the church is a contested question. Um, so at what levels? Uh, whether it's sociological descriptions of what Christians teach and practice, or was it a, a kind of the official theologies or everyday practice. I, mean, I think this is a contested topic, and um, so I think it's a very important topic. I do think with the um, Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, one um, major uh, the sign of the difference between Lutherans and within Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church's practice of this, who has authority, is that for Lutheran World Federation, our decisions were made by every member of the worldwide communion taking a vote. And then, um, so that it was a really democratic decision of, of all the members of the communion. And it was, took a long time for us to become clear about what the Vatican position was going to be of, in relation to the joint declaration because it wasn't that kind of open, uh, transparent process. So I think this, this is an ongoing question about um, who has the authority and uh, what is the role of the more democratic impulses that have arisen around the globe since the 16th century? And what is that role for the making of de decisions about what's proper to teach and practice? And even what constitutes a theological position? Some people say, oh, that's theological, that's sociological, but that's a contested distinction too. I would like to ask a question to Amy. Is that possible? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I was going to do that, but you go ahead. Um, you have um, Reformation is uh, was in your wonderful talk, really, um, and I learned from it. Um, Reformation is a kind of program. Yeah, it was not a historical Reformation that you talked on. It was. Uh, reformation as an ongoing process of renewal and that links up also with what you did in your nine points and you made it very concrete and, and, and visible in uh, historical contemporary instances, examples. Um, but so, um, uh, the question again um, of who speaks for the church. Uh, is it true that Protestant theology has a democratic idea of the church? I thought that we, always, that we still confess that Christ somehow is the Lord of the church and this, that his word is decisive. And that is exactly the problem because, okay, who interprets that word, yeah? And in that way, the Roman Catholic Church has a wonderful position because there is, it is very clear that they have one goalkeeper and that is the Pope, yeah? And if you don't know where to play the ball, then the ball goes back to the goalkeeper and he keeps it safe. Uh, we Protestants have no goalkeeper. 
So every it is it is kicking for open goal. Uh, do you do you have an do you have an, a solution for this problem of who speaks for Protestantism or have we or is our fate that that it is a wild situation? <laughs> well, not only that we don't have a goalkeeper, but that we keep you know fielding new teams and starting new games on, on different fields, yeah. right? So, so we don't even just have one game going. Um, well, surely you don't expect me to come up with a solution to this problem. Right, right. Um, I think I um, really am back with, with Calvin on this, that, that our, our hope in all this is not that um, human beings will finally get this right and come up with the, the perfect recipe for church that will, you know, bring both unity and faithfulness. You know, those sometimes seem to be in inverse proportion to each other, right? That, that the, um, the more unity you have, the, the less room there is for dissent and, and, and discernment and, and so on. Um, but that God isn't through and, and that the, the, the Holy Spirit is, is, is still some, somehow moving in the church. Uh, I do think that the, the best way to listen for the voice of Christ, to feel the movement of the Spirit, is to do that in community where um, a lot of voices are permitted to speak. So in, in that way, there is a kind of democratic process. Um, but, but I think finally, you know, we, we have to put our, our hope not in ourselves and our process and our, our program, um, but this, this sense that, that, um, there, there is, is still at, at the, the, the bottom of all this, something beyond our, our human agendas and plans that, that gives us a future. And I, I like, Amy, that you brought up um, the, the radical, radical, radical reforms having to do with marriage and considering sort of sexuality in the 16th century. So if we, uh, when I teach Reformation and I always give the five top reforms, I always underscore how radical it was that the 16th century priests were getting married and, and, and talking about sexuality in good terms and how that was not apart from how they understood church and church community and theology. They had to theologically argue for the right to have sex. So talking about theology and practice. Um, so would you say, Amy, that um, because today I, I think it's maybe your, in your church the same case as with the Lutherans, this issue of sexuality, we have spent so much energy on the rights of gays and lesbian persons to, first of all, to honor human beings as they are, but also then what kind of rights do they have in, in, in the church? Can we ordain? Can we marry? And, and the, the bigger issues of how to bring thinking of sexuality from the Middle Ages, those wonderful reforms in the late Middle Ages to this day, how do we reform our notions of sexuality today? Anyway, back to this issue of uh, rights of gays and lesbians. Um, um, how would you, would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? I, I felt like you were going to that direction as you were talking about how some good reforms and, and arguments we have had, they, they have an expiration date when they, don't, they no longer work. So would you like to elaborate on this a little bit from any position well, you want? Yeah, <laughs> um, it, it's, it's that I think the, the process of reformation is, is open-ended. You know, I, I don't think that um, Christ's body at any point can say, okay, we're done. You know, we've, we've, we've arrived at, at, at the, the, the fullness of God's intentions for the church. Um, so, so that's why I think there, there does need to be this ongoing process of, of argument and of discernment uh, that that there there isn't a kind of arbitrary place where we can say well well now um, you know now now we're done with reformation um, so I was really using that that as an example um, that that um, simply saying well okay clergy can be married but we're just going to stop there I mean there there are plenty of Protestants who would like to stop there right um, but but I think that the the notion of reformation. Uh, 
really, really um, takes that off the table, um, that, that God's spirit can, can um, keep, keep moving. And, and so then we always have these difficult issues of discernment, right? Is, is this the spirit that's moving um, or is this some other spirit that, that's moving the church? And, and I think there's no kind of easy way to, to decide that. Thank you. We have like one minute left. Um, who has not asked a question yet? Do you have a quick question that we can have a quick answer to? Yes. I, I have a quick question that I doubt is, has a quick answer. Oh. <laughs> but it's a, it has to do with um, center and bounded sets. And this is a, a, actually a conundrum that I have, is that I, um, as a Protestant, I, I value um, more democratic forms where different kinds of voices are able to be heard. And yet I noticed that the Catholic Church across the street actually has more diversity than most of the churches that I'm part of. Wow. And, um, and so I'm very warm to the idea of episcopacy as, as uh, a lot of people see it as the imposition of an outside power, but I've noticed that a lot of times it's actually able to bring other voices and cross um, even gender uh, gender as well as class and race in ways that perhaps the way that we Protestants do, we, we tend to divide ourselves even more. Can you help me <laughs> as I think through this, um, this tension between these two, uh, two impulses? In 30 seconds, who goes first? <laughs> no, sorry. I, I would start with, with the, the nationalistic boundaries of denominationalism that, that Case already pointed to. I, I think um, one of the reasons Protestantism can, can tend to form these tiny homogeneous little communities um, is, is precisely this, this absence of a transnational identity. Um, and, and that's why Roman Catholic parishes can be such exciting places. They're, they're not bound up in the same way with that. It was the reason that I said there are good arguments for episcopacy because a good bishop or uh, superintendent, as the German church says, uh, can really uh, have a wise policy in which the variety and also the messiness, messy church, uh, is clear. So not only life and uh, our, uh, our identity can be, and our marriages can be messy, Life is messy, but the church as uh, well. And a good bishop knows that, and he is a shepherd over all those different sheep. Mm -hmm. Or oh, she. Mm -hmm. I would like to, you know, reflect on this whole question of how, even within the Lutheran communion of churches, we have given time and space for some church, or, yeah, the Missouri Lutheran Church, to take its time to arrive at that decision of accepting women as pastors. I would like to ask this question. How fair is it to look at that question of Looking at women's bodies, or let me put it as bodies as equal, when did that become a subject of negotiableness and waiting for democratic you know, process to take place and majority of voices to accept that all you know, women can be accepted as priests? So, to take that, you know, to make our starting point as simply this. People, women and men, are equal, period. Mm -hmm. This is not negotiable. Mm -hmm. Non-negotiable equality, equity in terms of race, caste, gender, sexuality. So if this is our common point, then that can become the starting point to look at our present situation. How then do we address the 94% of white 
you know, uh, po uh, population within the church, how do we address it? Is there a way of taking up racial justice as our priority? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Speak up rather than asking the victims to kind of mm -hmm. come out and make it as their priority. So that's mm -hmm. where Thank I would you. say we need to start. Thank you. Yeah, very quick. Time to, um, I'm not sure I would uh, lift up the place of episcopacy in terms of the emphasis on diversity. I think my sense is in Roman Catholic ecclesiology, there's that robust sense of the local church and that really contests against, uh, at least in the United States, there's such a congregationalist emphasis of being church. It's my congregation and nobody should impose and maybe Presbyterians are better than Lutherans, but this really uh, close sense of being a congregation as being kind of autonomous. Mm -hmm. um, I think that sense of the local church that of which the bishop is a symbol, and there are many congregations that are um, in communion with the bishop and therefore in communion with each other, um, opens up a different sense of being Christian in communion with those who aren't physically present with you worshiping. Um, I don't have any data to back that up, but I, I'm theologically intrigued by that sense of the local church. Thank you. You see, if we had two more hours, it's getting very interesting here. I have a conclusion. <laughs> One minute, if you can bear. I've been listening and taking notes, so the words reformation, uh, what do we want to keep, what do we want to reform, where do we want to repent for, so uh, this is in no particular order. But this relates to my students. I ask them often, when you think of reformations then and now, what would you say are now the reformation issues, regardless of what you have in terms of solutions in your head? And these always come up. Uh, God language, misogyny, sexism, <laughs> violence against women, these are actual issues that if Luther was alive today, I'm sure he would say something about. Uh, racism, absolutely, Luther would be more than tweeting about the killing of, 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 of black citizens or not citizens of this country. Uh, queerphobia, absolutely. Looking at how Luther argued for marriage, I am positive he would be in the front line to, to demand the rights for gays and lesbians to marry, to be ordained. I am absolutely positive about that uh, if he lived in the 18th century. Uh, the elevation of clergy, still we elevate clergy. We still have not really lived through the principle of uh, priesthood of all believers. We are really struggling with that. Even Protestants, we have our popes. Um, yeah, many, actually. And maybe the most difficult one, Christ-centric theology. How to have Christ-centric theology? Do we need Christ-centric theology? But if we do, how can we have that without being anti-Jewish? absolutely a burning, burning issue of reform and repentance. And this issue of silence, can Christians be silent? Catherine Giselle from Strasbourg, one of the Reformation mothers said, well, sometimes there are times of when truth needs to be told and of, often our women rose to tell the truth when nobody else was doing it. So in that tradition, Catherine Giselle tried to bring people together, the Calvin's followers and Swingley's followers, Luther's followers, Boots's followers, she entertained people in her table by her table and wanted to bring people together. And her bottom line was, Christian charity knows no boundaries, but silence and non-action is not an option for Christians. So I think I'd like to conclude our session with her very wise words. Thank you for staying with us here.